There are two different kind of UFOs out there. There's mechanical and biological. Mechanical meaning things made by man or extraterrestrial. And why not? Our solar system is 4.6 billion years old and our universe is 14 billion years old. The Drake equation says there could be millions upon millions of planets out there containing advanced life forms. In just 150 years, we've seen the automobile, air flight, computers, space flight in 150 years. Who's to say that the wormhole theory and extra dimensional space travel might not be more than just theory? Do you really believe that civilizations millions of years in our advance could not develop beyond our current development? When we look and see something in our skies, are we watching millions of years of evolved technology used to observe the growth of our planet, or are we watching biological entities that have adapted to Earth's largest habitat, a habitat that is proven to contain food, water, and intermolecular forces on a grand scale? We've only explored 5% of our oceans and are finding new species every day. How much have we explored our atmosphere? Based on their advanced technology, anything we send up in our skies can be duplicated and made functional. One of the differences mechanical UFOs has over atmospheric animals is possibly the ability to do what we call cloaking, or making themselves invisible. The wavelength spectrum is huge, but our visible light spectrum falls between infrared and ultraviolet. Anything mechanical outside this visible spectrum is cloaking. So if we wanted to observe a simple society, or animals for that matter, we would have to camouflage or mimic our equipment, making it undetectable as not to scare them or disrupt their lives. Could we be so egocentric to think that they are trying to fake us out? Well, if they're mechanical, I believe yes. If they don't want to draw attention to themselves or be investigated, by all means they should look as common as they can. So I wanted to show you a quick video on Story Musgrave, a very famous American astronaut. Dr. Story Musgrave is a veteran of five American shuttle missions who has seen and photographed several unidentified flying objects in space. Dr. Musgrave does not believe they are craft from another planet. On two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, um, I have seen a, a snake out there. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there, and that sort of brings to you a, really a certainty that, uh, that other living creatures are out there. Some are incredibly primitive, more primitive than us. Some just, uh, just proteins coming together, amino acids, and some just single cell organisms. And other Our atmosphere contains water, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, sunlight, heat, and electricity on an unimaginable scale. Astronauts found living plankton-sized organisms clinging to the International Space Station. Life somehow adapted and now thrive in the aerobic and anaerobic freezing vacuum of space. Many scientists believe that if life was to exist on planets like Venus or moons like Titan, they would probably live in their atmosphere because their atmosphere contains many of the same ingredients we have that are conducive to life. There may be life out there, but not as we know it. They may be different from what we expect. So why do some of them look like balloons? What's interesting is that plankton is where all animal body types, or phyla, first evolved. There are only 30 animal phyla, but only a handful of the major ones dared to go onto land. Some plankton have elongated appendages called cilia. Most of the appendages that come off these animals are used for feeding, sensing, stability, and mobility. So bottom line, they're just kind of naturally this way. This is the way they look. The other explanation is that they mimic or camouflage. But why would they want to do that? It came to me one day when I saw a small, elongated, white drifting object about 100 feet up get snatched out of the sky by a sparrow. It occurred to me that they are doing what other animals here on Earth are doing to protect themselves. They mimic. Since the atmospheric animals cannot blend into the background of the sky, they must resort to mimicking. Mimicking is something many animals here on land and underwater have evolved and resorted to for survival purposes. There are so many varieties that I've seen over the years that they remind me a lot of plankton. You know, plankton comes from the Greek word meaning drifter. And if they're anything like plankton, they've been drifting around and evolving for about 300 million years. Mimicking is typically a defensive strategy. Some atmospheric animals use mimicry as a passive camouflage and are largely unnoticed by predators like the straight stick pipefish 
which waves in the current. Some animals do this thing called Batesian mimicry, which is trying to make themselves look less appetizing. What animal wants to eat something that looks like metal? Or even eat something that could be poisonous? Another reason why these animals mimic is because their predators are faster than they are. One of the main predatory creatures many animals fear are birds. Birds are the evolutionary descendants of dinosaurs. They go after everything. Fish, reptiles, insects, amphibians, and even mammals. Birds go after other birds. These things are extreme predators. Birds are not only the fastest creatures on Earth, they have the sharpest eyesight. Birds are what we call tetrachromats, meaning they have four color receptors compared to our three. Many of them can see in the ultraviolet range, which begs the question, why do they need to see in the ultraviolet light spectrum? The answer is for food. So is it possible for living creatures that have been evolving for billions of years possess the ability to either look metallic or transform and mimic unappetizing objects in the sky? Here are a few examples. So how do we know if they are actually mimics? We have to examine the study of aerial phenomenon. Since most people think that these are balloons, we have to specifically study aerial debris. Now we've all grown up with balloons and we all kind of know, whether they're foil or latex generally, how they behave. Through a lifetime of inductive reasoning and inference, we make impulsive conclusions. But what if what we see doesn't follow the rules? The only way we can tell for sure is to analyze it. We are faked out every day by things we think are real. Whether it's a patch of astroturf, a cell phone tower, or an outdoor speaker, we tend not to pay attention. But something that all mimics have in common is what I call indications of imitation. These are subtle, abnormal characteristics mimics possess that give themselves away. It doesn't matter if they are man-made or naturally selected. There are indications of facade. Atmospheric animals are no exception. Observing the characteristics of balloons is relatively simple. This is not brain surgery. Although lately, exotic balloons have entered the market and have complicated things, which only forces us to increase our scrutiny, which is fine. Knowing that atmospheric animals have evolved and have the ability to transform and change their morphology, they still possess, quote, normal criteria, meaning size, shape, theme, color, type, texture, kinesiology, which means the study of movement, direction, tether, and tether attachments. Ultimately, we have to find out whether or not these things exist. Can we find them in a store or on the internet? Normal balloons do not go outside this criteria. Back on November 23, 2002, Space Shuttle Endeavour was launched as mission STS-113. Once they reached cruising altitude of about 200 to 240 miles up, they began taking high-resolution pictures of the surface of the Earth, I suspect probably about one second apart. If they were traveling about the same speed of the International Space Station, they'd be traveling around 17,500 miles an hour, or about 5 miles per second. Just like many pictures that come from NASA and JPL, these pictures wound up going to Arizona State University and posted online. People started to look at these pictures and finding little floating objects closer to the Earth's surface, and some people were calling them UFOs. NASA's response was that these were just artifacts. If you know anything about photography, you know about artifacts. The objects seen in these photos were not digital image processing errors, like chromatic aberrations, blooming, noise, jaggies, or maze artifacts. The camera was focused on infinity. There was no way these objects were small floaters just outside the window. You would have never seen them. These artifacts did not transfer from picture to picture. These pictures show what we see on the ground. Those pictures from Arizona State University have since been taken down. Fortunately, I was able to download them and upload them to my website so you can investigate for yourself. See the link below. There has been many ancient civilizations that have seen these objects in our skies and there was less stuff to mimic, so they probably took on weirder shapes. Since we didn't understand them, they were considered evil. I think we are beginning to understand that these objects are more scientific and not supernatural or evil. 
that even though that they are rare, they do exist. One more thing that I discovered, and I will continue to do research, and it will be the topic of my next video, but when we telepathically call for them, whether collectively or not collectively, they come to our location. And I know it's going to sound counterintuitive, but many people from around the world are practicing these telepathic techniques and are videotaping the results and capturing these objects in the sky. Here is a good example of what we see in capture, a flyby. This flyby flies behind these two stationary objects. If this flyby is approximately 12 to 13 inches in diameter based on pixel size and traveling distance, this was traveling over 40 miles an hour. It's an impossible speed for a balloon in this weather. When we blow up this object, it looks like a balloon. We have to come to the fact that sometimes these things look like balloons. And then again, there are atmospheric animals that don't have to mimic and don't have to worry about predators due to size, shape, or coloration. I hope you like this video and I hope you understand this concept of atmospheric animal mimicking. I think the hardest part of this concept is breaking through years of indoctrination of agency. What we are seeing in our skies is scientific. There is nothing supernatural about this phenomenon. Our atmosphere is Earth's largest environment. If we were to stick our heads in the ocean right now, we probably won't see any fish, but that doesn't mean there are no fish in the ocean. There is a lot we can learn from these creatures. The general public and the scientific community have to keep an open mind on this subject. I think this could be one of the greatest discoveries in history, and I invite you to be part of it. Please join LA UFO channel on meetup.com and attend our UFO sighting events. Honestly, you won't believe until you see it with your own eyes. We always have a lot of fun and a lot of great ideas are shared, so we'll see you there.